I'm continually blown away as we go through Exodus to see God's heart, not only to deliver his own people, but to reveal himself even to his enemies. As you join us on this week's podcast, you're gonna be blessed as we talk about the power of the blood of the Lamb. Welcome to another Portions podcast. I am so blessed again, Nathan. I don't know. Every week I think, okay, he's not going to come back next week. And here you are. You show up every week. Until you change the lock, Scott. <laughs> I'm going to keep just showing up. <laughs> well, thanks so much for coming. Dude, we're, I'm so um, enjoying just this. Uh, we, we started Exodus a couple weeks ago. I, yeah. Obviously, I enjoy Genesis. I enjoy yeah. the Bible. Yeah. But this theme of God interjecting himself in history yes. for the purpose of revealing himself is absolutely amazing. Last week, we kind of centered in on the topic of him doing it because he wants not only his people, but even his enemies to know, yes. I am the Lord. So this week's portion is uh, Exodus 10, 1 through 13, 16. Just to back up and refresh everyone's memory, the children of Israel have been in Egypt for 430 some odd years. They've been in slavery. They've been in bondage. They cried out to God. God heard their cry and chose to move at that time in history. Moses is born supernaturally, saved by midwives who decided, no, they were not going to cast the firstborn into the Nile, but they were going to save the children of Israel, Shifra and Pua. They were the two midwives that we talked about way back in Exodus chapter one. God chose Moses as a deliverer, but also chose that he wouldn't be acting as deliverer until he's 80. Right. He's 40, he's at the prime of his life. He, he, he starts acting like a deliverer. God sends him to the backside of the desert, Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. Moses is there, God shows up in a bush. He says, go to Pharaoh. Moses says, who am I that I should go? He's 80. His brother Aaron is 86. I mean, these guys, I'm sorry, 83. 83 yeah. These guys are up in age. <laughs> By the way, let's not think that just because we're getting up in age that God is done using us. No, maybe that's actually the best time to think, okay, Lord, what do you want to do through me? Yeah. God sends Moses to Pharaoh and says, you tell Pharaoh, I am the Lord. Yes. We talked about the I am the Lord theme last week. We talked about the first seven plagues. We're getting ready to go into the eighth plague, but I just want to start by reading the first three verses of Exodus 12, just to step, set the stage. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh. I've hardened his heart and the heart of his servants that I may perform these signs of mine among them. And then listen to verse two, staggering in a way. I, just to back up into verse one, I've hardened his heart um, that I may perform these signs of mine and verse two, that you may tell in the hearing of your sons and your grandson how I have made a mockery of the Egyptians, how I have performed my signs among them, that you may know that I am the Lord." There's something in God's heart that's utterly generational. Yes. He's not doing this just for this generation. That's right. He's doing it so that this generation would proclaim to their sons yes. and their grandsons. He talks about that later on in this portion also, that I am the Lord. God's, God's moving in our lives is not just for us. Oh my goodness. It's for our, our sons and our grandsons and our great grandsons and daughters yeah. that God that God isn't just thinking about our deliverance today he's thinking about the blessing that his movement in our lives will be to our children's children absolutely he's he's the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob yes. right yes. he even introduces himself that way making it clear it's generational it's generation. I'm in this for the long term. This yeah. is who I am. And and you said it, Scott. What a great recap, man. I, I, that was awesome. I just, <laughs> I just, I feel like I'm totally caught up on, on where we are. But think about this. It is God's heart that he would be revealed not only to his people, but to the nations. Yeah. 
And we see, even as what he's saying in Exodus 10, um, I want you to see how I've dealt with these people so that you'll know that I am the Lord. But he's not saying because I want to destroy these people and I hate them, mm. right? He's saying, look, these people don't, they don't worship me. They have false gods. Yeah. I'm judging those gods. Yeah. I'm revealing myself. And we even see if we back up just a few verses coming into this portion in Exodus 9, uh, 20, those officials of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord. Wait, the officials of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord? They hurried to bring their slaves and their livestock inside. What was the point? God told them in the plague of the, the hail and the livestock. Yeah, talk about this. I, this is great. I am going to send this, this hail like you've never seen before. It's going to kill everything out in the field. So God says, why don't you bring your cows in, your servants in? So he tells them what he's going to do. His enemies. His enemies. Yeah. If he hates them, if he wants to wipe them out, why tell them? The point is, I am demonstrating my power. And so it says, verse 20, those officials of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord. What is happening? Slowly, there are some whose hearts are being turned to fear the Lord wow. more than they fear Pharaoh wow. or they fear these Egyptian gods that they've had. Yeah. And this is the point. God wants to reveal himself and he spares those, the ones that brought their cattle in. Those cattle didn't die. Yeah. The point is... God is wanting to reveal himself, not just to Israel, but to the nations. It's happening. And that gets us into these last three plagues uh, that we see. And it sets us up for, you know, you talk about this theme of remembrance. Mm. It, this is the Passover coming up. And you're yeah. going to see you know, where it all lays out in Scripture here in this, in this portion. But it's all about remembrance. And it's fascinating to think about. We got into this situation. We remember that Joseph was forgotten, mm. right? A new Pharaoh comes to power. A new king comes to power and doesn't remember who Joseph is, right? So therefore, he enslaves the children of Israel. Yeah. Now Moses kills the Egyptian, goes to the backside of the desert, and while he's gone, a new Pharaoh is put in charge. Who doesn't know who Moses is, right? Mm -hmm. So in both cases, they forget. In both cases, God wants us to remember. Yeah. And really, we're going to see that theme of remembrance throughout this portion. I love that. I love that. The theme of remembrance. Uh, before we dive into that, just one more um, verse from the outset of this portion, which begins in Exodus 10, verse 3. Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? There it is. I'm reminded in the book of James God opposes the proud. God gives grace to the humble. I believe that, in, and I could be wrong in my theology, that if Pharaoh would have humbled himself, God would have worked in an entirely different way. I believe that. That there's none of us... Uh, there may be people who are watching or listening today that have said, I've done so much against right. God. He's done with me. There's no hope for me. But that's that's really not the case because the case is if we will humble ourselves, there's nothing that we have done that ultimately disqualifies us from being a son or daughter of God if we would choose to humble ourselves. The scary thing is, yeah. Nathan, is the more that we refuse to humble ourselves, the more our hearts get hardened. So that ultimately, yes, God was revealing himself to the sons of Pharaoh. God was revealing himself. And there were people in Egypt who feared the Lord and brought their cattle in right. so that the hail would not destroy them. But woe to us who refuse to bow our knee to the Lord. I have people in my life who have told me, Listen, what you believe is fine, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to waste my life believing that Jesus is the Messiah of the Jewish people. Maybe on my deathbed, maybe on my deathbed. And I'm like, no, that, that's not the case because the more you harden your, the more you harden your heart, the more you refuse to humble yourself, yeah. the less likely you're going to be in the day of visitation to bow that knee yeah. to God. So I really believe, Nathan, that in God's heart, he's just looking. 
He's looking for people to be like him. Yeah. The humble king. The humble king. The humble king. And that's that's so true, Scott. I love that you draw that out. I mean, even in the book of Romans, it reminds us that God gave people over to their wicked desires. Mm -hmm. Why? Ultimately, I've heard it said this way, and it's a great quote, and if I was a great scholar, I'd remember who said it, and I don't. <laughs> but ultimately, the idea was, this quote that's coming to mind as we're sitting here, is, you know, in the end of our life, God ultimately gives us the thing we wanted most. And if we wanted to be close to Him, yeah. then we're with Him. Yeah. And if we wanted to be away from Him, then we'll be away from wow. Him. And it's that idea that God responds to our hearts. Mm. And when we harden it, He lets them be hard. Mm. And when we humble ourselves, He meets us in that place of humility. The beautiful thing, which this is why I'm glad He's God and I'm not, you know, yeah. is He's never so far that He's not willing mm. to reach again. Mm. And so no matter how hard someone's heart's been, whether it's you, me, or someone watching or listening, um, if we will humble ourselves, that's where He'll show up. Yeah, And He'll say, I can work with that. Wow. And we see that and we look at even the officials in Exodus 10, 7. Pharaoh's officials said to him, how long will this man be a snare to us? Let the people go so they may worship the Lord their God. Do you not yet realize Egypt is ruined? <laughs> <laughs> Pharaoh's own officials are starting to do the simple math saying, this is not working. Yeah. You know? yeah. Our arrogant, stubborn thing is not getting us anywhere. Mm. They're recognizing it, but Pharaoh will not soften his heart. And so some people will read this portion and say, well, it's not fair. Mm -hmm. I mean, Pharaoh didn't get a chance to choose. It says God hardened his mm -hmm. heart, you know. Well, ultimately, Pharaoh hardened his own heart, mm -hmm. and then the Lord continued to let his heart be hardened. Yeah, that's good. And it's that same idea of we get the thing that we actually want. Yeah. And the truth is, I don't know about your life, I know of me, there are things I thought I wanted, and when I got it, I didn't want it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and this is, I think, in Pharaoh's case, uh, a, a great example of that. Yeah, that's really, really good, bro. Really, really good. So we are on plague 8, 9, and 10, the, the last portion we talked about, the first seven plagues. And you brought out a great point that each of these plagues were directly pointed to the gods of Egypt whether it was uh, the Nile, the frogs, the flies, the gnats, the livestock, the boils, the hail. And here, the last three plagues are locust, darkness, and death of the firstborn. Yeah. So do you wanna, any, anything come to mind with regard to those last three plagues? Well, again, you see a consistent pattern that there are deities in Egypt that are worshiped that each of these elements are connected to. Right. So yes, God is uh, showing a sign and a wonder, He's showing it for the sake of the Hebrew children to put their faith in Him and for the Egyptians to see. Yeah. But for those Egyptians that are paying attention, they're recognizing mm. we have gods that control the storms yeah. and control the sun. Ra, yeah. a lot of people would have heard of, you know. Um, you know, and then when it comes to the death of the firstborn, Pharaoh is supposed to be, even the name is supposed to be son of Ra. He's the son of, he's a, he's a god. He's a, yeah. a little deity. And so it's a striking even at Pharaoh himself. Wow. You think you're the firstborn. I'm the god of the firstborn. Yeah. You know, and again, when we get to that, I don't want to jump ahead, but when we get to that portion, that, that part in the scripture, it's God's heart that none of the children would die. That's right. And just like we saw, you know, when we looked back that uh, when it came to the hail and the livestock, that there were those Egyptians that began to say, hey, we should listen. We should fear the Lord, <laughs> right. the God of Israel. Yeah. And they responded. Any of the Egyptians that would respond and, and mark their doorposts with the blood as was right. required as we talk about the Passover, they would be spared. Yeah. Likewise, any of the the children of Israel that did not mark the doorposts yep. with the blood, they yep. would have experienced the death angel. The point is God is the one who was worthy and he's the one that's wanting to be revealed more yep. than anything else. And we see this played out again, these plagues. Yeah, it's remarkable. Ultimately culminating in the final plague, which is the death of the firstborn. But before that, that, before that actually happens, as you alluded to, God gives specific instructions to the people of Israel. And even in the midst of God poking in the eye, as you as you uh, termed it, of the Egyptians of the Egyptian gods, yeah. he's setting up a scenario that really that really 
is an entree to ultimately him sending his firstborn, right? His only son. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. So here, the firstborn son will die if they don't have the blood on the doorpost of the house, which we're going to talk about. But he's really, the Lord in his genius is setting up something so remarkable that the children of Israel every year since this time, yes, every single year, 2,500 in a row, (laughs) that they're going to celebrate this Passover. And and Exodus chapter 12 talks about the Passover. And we could talk about this for weeks. We only have about five minutes. But in this portion of Exodus 12, and friends, I really want to encourage you, grab your Bibles, read this portion. But Exodus 12 is significant. It's a significant portion. God tells the children of Israel, okay, listen, I want each household to have a lamb. I want you to take that lamb. I want you to slay the lamb. And I want you to take the blood of that lamb. And I want you to appropriate. I want you to put it on the doorposts and lentils of your home. And then um, in verse 11, you shall eat the lamb in this manner with your loins girded, uh, chapter 12, verse 11, sandals on your feet, and you shall eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. It's not Israel's Passover. It's not Moses' Passover. It's the Lord's Passover. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I'm the Lord. And verse 13, check this out, Nathan. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So bro, the distinguishing factor of deliverance was the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of the home. So I know we talk about this at Passover. So if somebody said, I'm a wise child of, of one of, you know, of a Jewish sage and I am there and Moses says, okay, here's what you're gonna do. I mean, whoever, whoever gave this kind of instruction, you're gonna take a lamb, right. you're gonna kill it, and you're gonna put the blood on the doorposts of the house. What kind of wisdom is that? It seems utterly foolish. Plus Moses is like 80, maybe 81 now. It's like, dude, this guy, what if, what if, uh, what if one of the Jewish fathers said, this guy's ridiculous, we're not gonna do that. Yeah. Well, when the, when, when the death angel comes, because there's no blood on that house, firstborn, dead. Because it had nothing to do with your DNA and everything to do with the blood. And in the same way, if the Egyptians would have said, hey, I, I got wind of this secret, kind of like the hail, hail's coming, yep. let's pull, let's our, ca- let's pull yep. our cattle in. It's the same thing. So it's the blood of the lamb that brings deliverance. I can't believe we're coming to an end of this podcast already. We've got just a few minutes. Talk about, Nathan, just the significance of the blood of the lamb, the significance of Passover, and how we can make this um, meaningful in our lives today. Yeah, well, Scott, you've, you've said it so well. Ultimately, God wants to be known. And and even in this portion that we're reading in Exodus 12, that sets us up to understand that God wants this celebrated every single year in in perpetuity about the Passover. That's where he says in verse 12, um, I will strike down every firstborn of people and animals and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. Again, it's a reminder. God knows what is best for us. And when we are enslaved, whether we think it's uh, a good thing or not, when we're enslaved to lesser deities, Mm. he will judge those deities Mm. because he knows those things are not good for us. us. He knows that he is the God of of heaven and earth. And he is the one that will provide the lamb so that whosoever believes, who would ever apply the blood 
to the doorposts would not only be spared death, but we'd be brought into life. Mm. Because it's because of this that ultimately Pharaoh says, get out, get you know, out. go. Mm. And, and that's what gets us to the end of this, of this portion. And man, we are saved by the blood of the Lamb. Yeah. Yeshua, Jesus, the one that John the Baptist said, Behold, the, the Lamb of God. of God who takes away the sin of the world. That blood that was shed can be applied to anyone's heart who would simply humble themselves and believe. And our God, we look at, we see all this judgment. Oh, He must be harsh and hard. No, it's His love, it's His mm. kindness that will rebuke the things that steal from us yeah. so that we can have life everlasting. Yeah, and that's really that. the picture of the Passover in, in a few words. The picture of the Passover. And it was this very meal, the Passover meal, that Jesus chose to share with his disciples before he gave his life exactly. so that deliverance could come to anyone that would bow the knee. The blood of the lamb is the deliverance of the nations. It it's really, really beautiful. Friends, I, I want to encourage you, if you want to know more about the Passover, write to me personally. Just shoot me an email, scott at togetherforisrael.org. That's my email address. Just say, hey, how can I get more information about the Passover? We've got some, uh, some info or videos that we can send you. We've been so, so blessed as a ministry to do Passover seders around the country and around the world. I, I think Nathan, I think I'm doing four or five Passover seders in the month. It's either March or April. I can't even remember. It's really, really an amazing picture of Jesus who is our Passover lamb. If today's podcast has been a blessing to you, can I encourage you to share it? Can I encourage you to tell your friends about our app? If you don't have our app, you can download it. Go to the app store, type in together for Israel. All of our podcast video and audio are on our app along with awesome, awesome information about other ways that you can stand with us in supporting the believers in the land of Israel. Until next week, I am Scott. This is Nathan, <laughs> who is, I hope he shows up next week. <laughs> Will you come back next week? If you'll have. Okay, come back next to, yeah. week. Sounds Look forward good. to seeing you next week on another Portions Podcast. <laughs>